Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of Geography Now. We're going to go through the list of all the internationally recognized sovereign nations of the world, and we're going to do it alphabetically, which means our first episode is going to be on Afghanistan. It's time to learn geography now! That's the intro song, I hope you liked it. I worked really hard recording it with my friend Bill. So, today's gonna be Afghanistan. I'm actually really glad we're getting this country covered because it's a very complex and deep country and we can't cover all of it in 10 minutes, so I'm gonna try to do my best. Before we get into anything though, let's dissect the flag. The Afghani flag is a tri-color band of three different colors, red, black, and green. The red representing the blood of those who fought for Afghanistan, the black representing the obscure and difficult past that they've had, and the green representing hope and a future, and Islam as it is the state religion. In the middle of the flag is the Afghani emblem. Now this is where things get a little difficult, so bear with me. On the emblem is a mosque with two little miniature Afghani flags on the side, which by the way makes Afghanistan one of the only two countries in the world that has a flag with miniature versions of its own flag on its own flag. On the side are sheaves of wheat, on the top is the Shahada, or the Muslim Creed. On the bottom is the name of Afghanistan, written in Arabic. And on top of that is the Arabic year of 1298, written in Arabic numerals, which also in the standard Gregorian calendar is 1919, which was the year that Afghanistan was relinquished from its British protectorate status and became an internationally recognized sovereign nation known as Afghanistan. In terms of its political geography, Afghanistan is located in the Central Asian region surrounded by six other countries, technically seven if you consider the Jammu Kashmir region part of India, but Pakistan will tell you it totally is not, but we'll discuss that in another video. Now when you look at the shape of Afghanistan, it just kind of looks like a big amorphous blob in the middle of nowhere, but then when you look at the northeast, you start to see this long narrow stretch of land that kind of reaches out into the Hindu Kush mountain range, and you might ask yourself, why does Afghanistan have that long panhandle? And the reason why is kind of technically because England and Russia. See, back in the 1800s, the British and the Russians were competing against each other to see who could amass the largest global empire in terms of colonization and influence. Russia took over what are now known as many of the Central Asian countries as Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, while the British took over many of the South Asian regions such as India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Now, when it came to Afghanistan, things were a little difficult because the Afghani people really did not want to be taken over. It was also a really crucial point on the map because essentially it was the area where the British and Russian empires got really close to each other. Eventually the British kind of took over at the end of the 19th century, much to the reluctance of the Afghanis. However, they still had to distinguish the borders between Afghanistan and the rest of the other nations in the empire. When it came to Pakistan, or back then British India, the British decided to use the Durand Line, and when it came to the Russian Empire, they decided to use the Panj and Palmyra Rivers. Now the thing is, when both the empires drew these lines, they technically didn't touch each other in the northeast and left a huge, long, narrow buffer zone which is now today known as the Wakhan Corridor. By default, it was given to Afghanistan, and to this day, the Wakhan Corridor plays a very crucial role in Afghanistan's geography because for a very, very small 20 or so mile border at the very end of the Wakhan Corridor is a border with China. Now, I know 20 miles doesn't really sound like much, but in the world of geopolitical analytics, that can be a very important thing. Now, when it comes to physical geography, Afghanistan has a large, vast array of different kinds of landscapes. However, the large portion of the country is actually mountainous, with the Hindu Kush mountain range dominating the northeast regions and the central regions of the country. In fact, the snow melt from these mountains accounts for the vast majority of the complex, immense river systems that flow throughout Afghanistan, allowing their country to have lush, green valleys where most of their agricultural sector can be found. Now, despite all the rivers and water reservoirs, Afghanistan still remains a relatively dry nation. In fact, the further south you go, closer to the Kandahar region, almost immediately after you pass the Dori River, you hit the Sistan Basin, which is basically what geologists speculate may have actually been a large body of water at some point, but is now a dry, desolate desert wasteland. Nonetheless, with the arable land that it does have, Afghanistan is still able to produce some of the world's best produce, including pomegranates, almonds, apricots, and poppy. That's right, for the past few hundred years, Afghanistan has been a leading nation in opium production. In terms of its demographics, Afghanistan has just about 31 million people, or roughly a little bit smaller than the size of Canada. The slight majority of these people identify as ethnically Pashtun, or people from the Pashtun tribe. They speak the Pashtun language known as Pashto. Now there are some other ethnic minorities like Uzbeks and Tajiks and Hazaras. However, the interesting thing is that the majority of the people, about 85%, including the Pashtuns, speak Dari. Dari is actually a dialect of the Persian language Farsi. 
So that means someone who speaks Dari can actually interchangeably travel between Afghanistan and Iran without really having any trouble being understood. Interesting side note, there is one last living Jew living in all of Afghanistan. I'm not even joking. His name is Zablon Simintov. He lives in Kabul. He used to own a restaurant and he maintains the last synagogue in all of Afghanistan. The locals there know him just as that one Jew guy and they're cool with him. They're just like, hey Zablon. Which brings us to our final segment, the friend zone. Afghanistan has a very interesting way in how it interacts with other countries. Now, because of the whole language thing, Afghanis and Iranians have typically kind of had somewhat of a cultural similarity and resonance with each other. However, they also have had some controversy. Now, Pakistan and India are the biggest business partners of Afghanistan. However, again, there's some drama there as well. Now, when it comes to their best friend, Afghanistan considers Turkey their best friend. They've cooperated with each other peacefully for over a hundred years, and there's an old Afghani saying, no Afghani was ever killed by a Turkish bullet, and no Afghani trained by a Turk ever betrayed his country. So in conclusion, I guess this is the last segment, never mind. Putting aside all of the modern day controversies, Afghanistan is actually a very beautiful country with a very rich and vibrant yet often hidden cultural and historical past that very often goes overlooked. And that's our objective here at Geography Now. We want to shine light on the obscure and put on display the often neglected yet fascinating attributes of every region of the world. We hope you did you justice. Stay History was in the making in 2013 as the Afghanistan Football Federation inspired us all with its outstanding achievements in football. Although the nation continues to suffer after years of conflict, the Federation continues to develop as it reaches out to an even bigger audience, including all members of society, young and old, male and female. Eight teams from across the nation took part in the second edition of the Afghan Premier League. The Afghan people had been waiting 10 years to see their national team play, and on the 20th of August 2013, they got their wish as they played against Pakistan in a landmark friendly. And only one month later, they won the South Asian Football Federation Cup 
by beating India 2-0. The remarkable exploits of the Afghanistan national team are helping to build solidarity and unity within the country, encouraging peace and creating excitement and pride amongst the people. This is a story about people who give hope to a nation, using the power of football and upholding the spirit of fair play. To receive the Laureus Spirit of Sport Award on behalf of the Afghanistan cricket team, please welcome Dr. Noor Mohammed Murad. Present the award, Academy members and two of the finest cricketers the world has ever seen. Please welcome Steve Waugh and Kapil Dev. The Academy are very proud of uh, your team's achievements, uh, especially so five years ago, you were, in the, sorry, you were in the fifth division a couple of years ago, and now you've qualified for the 2015 World Cup, which is a quite remarkable achievement. Well done. You know, I personally feel, uh, being very close to that part of the world, I'm proud of you, you're winning the award. Afghanistan gone through such a rough time, hard time, despite of your keep on playing cricket, hats off to you. Proud of you. Well done. Congratulations. Well done.